Good evening, everyone. I'm Josephine Nelbantoglu. I'm the Dean of uh, Graduate Studies, and uh, I notice a pattern. <laughs> One half of the room is so much more occupied than the other half. <laughs> Maybe in the middle we'll switch over. So we're very pleased to welcome you tonight to this year's uh, Tomlinson Talks. Uh, this event has been organized in honor of Dr. Richard Tomlinson, uh, who's made a very generous contribution years ago to graduate research at McGill University. And we've, uh, we launched a series in this format last year and was very, very successful. So we're repeating it. You know, if something works, we stick to it. Uh, and we hope that you will find it memorable, and it's to showcase really uh, all the work that's done by the exceptional and talented graduate students we have at McGill. Dr. Tomlinson uh, is not here. He hasn't been able to come for the past uh, couple of years. I think Dr. Tomlinson is in it's almost mid-90s now, and he no longer runs the marathons he used to. Uh, but it is being videotaped, and we did the same thing last year. We sent him a videotape of all the talks so that he could uh, participate from his home. And uh, I'd like to welcome now uh, Professor Manfredi, our provost, who will be giving us a bit of a background on uh, Dr. Tomlinson and uh, his donation to graduate studies. Chris. Thanks a lot, uh, Joe. It's a, it's a great pleasure to be able to be here and tell you a little bit about Dr. Tomlinson and his uh, gift to the university and the Tomlinson Fellowships. Those of you who hold them know a lot more about them than, than others. Uh, but it's my pleasure to, uh, to say a few words uh, about, uh, about Richard. Dr. Tomlinson graduated from McGill in with a PhD in chemistry in 1948 under the supervision of Otto Maas. So that building actually has a person behind it. He held a postdoctoral fellowship at the National Research Council in Ottawa and at Cambridge University. In 1950, he joined the Department of Chemistry at McMaster University, where he served as chair of the department and is now a professor emeritus. He's the founding director of the Genom Corporation, which became a major manufacturer of microchips for digital signal processing, as well as the world's largest supplier of microchips for hearing aids. Uh, Dr. Tomlinson has made numerous gifts to McGill, one of which is the Tomlinson Doctoral Fellowship. And those fellowships were created in 2000. Uh, they are worth $35,000 a year for up to three years. Uh, about 20 fellowships are awarded annually by graduate and postdoctoral studies for new students accepted into a doctoral program at McGill. And obviously they are a significant contribution to recruiting and supporting exceptional graduate students across all disciplines in the university. The gift is significant, of course, because of its aim, which is to attract high caliber students to McGill University. And that program, which is very prestigious, uh, those of you who hold them should understand how prestigious it is to hold those fellowships, uh, does indeed foster exceptional graduate scholarship at McGill uh, as one of Canada's leading research intensive universities. So why are we here today? Uh, since the establishment of the fellowship in 2000, the Tomlinson Talks has been a recurring event to showcase graduate research excellence at McGill. And tonight you'll be hearing from six Tomlinson scholars from a range of disciplines, and I'm looking forward to hearing their talks. They're very well curated, although I sort of hate that word, but they are curated. And so I hope you'll enjoy them as much as I will. So without further uh, delay, I'll turn it back over to Josephine, who will introduce our moderator. So thank you very much. So I'd like to introduce our moderator, uh, who's going to keep everything on schedule. Uh, it's uh, Professor Ian Strachan from the Faculty of Agricultural and Environmental Sciences at McDonald College. He's been involved in graduate education for many, many years, and he's one of the uh, foremost uh, champions of graduate students uh, on both campuses. Uh, Ian will uh, present the bios and the speakers. Thank you, Joe. Um, normally this role involves timekeeping, but 
we've done a little twist this year, which makes my job really easy. The challenge to the six students was prepare 20 slides, and they're going to advance automatically, and you have to stay on time. So there's not going to be any yellow cards or red cards coming up to the speakers. You know what you have to do, okay? So um, you're in for a treat. You have six great talks that are going to be about six minutes, not about, they are going to be six minutes and 40 seconds each, and after which I'll invite questions from the audience. So without further ado, our first presenter is Carolyn Dietrich, who is a Tomlinson doctoral scholar in the Department of Bioresource Engineering at the absolutely beautiful McDonald campus of McGill University. Carolyn studied chemistry in Germany, and after finishing her master's, she began research on compostable plastics as part of a research internship in Saudi Arabia. In September 2015, she joined the research group of Professor Marie-José Dumont for her PhD in bioresource engineering. Carolyn. Thank you very much for the introduction. Despite ongoing climate change, we still live in societies that are largely dependent on oil. So what could we do if we want to change this? One of the alternatives would be to drive an electric car, like a Tesla, and thereby reducing emissions. But fuel is not the only product of petroleum that we use on a daily basis. Plastics are made of only 4% of the barrel of oil, but they generate 44% of the revenues of a petroleum refinery. Global plastic production has been continuously rising since the 1950s and is still a growing market today. So my name is Caroline Dietrich and I am doing my research in the group of marie Josée Dumont in cooperation with Louis Del Rio. And today I'd like to talk to you about the green production of a bioplastic. Like petroplastics, there are many different types of bioplastics and each of them have their advantages and disadvantages. <coughs> PHA is like the Tesla of bioplastics. It can replace current products, so does substitute. It also adds new value because it's an addition, compostable and non-toxic. It is greener, but not entirely harmless in its current production, and it's usually unaffordable. PHA stands for polyhydroxyalkanoates, but all you have to remember is PHA. It is a long chain of molecules that is produced inside bacteria, um, when you feed them a carbon source, usually commonly sugars, in a process that is similar to brewing beer. So the question is, can PHA contribute to replacing these 4% of the barrel of oil? The bottleneck here is really the price, and up to 48% of the cost comes from the sugar. Currently, we use mainly cornstarch to make these sugars, and we need alternatives that are cheaper and greener. Think of any plan you know, um, all grasses, leaves, stalks, stems, trees are made of the three main co uh, of the same three components in various amounts. So this makes them the most abundant biomass on Earth. From them, cellulose and hemicellulose are made of sugar units. So um, it makes great substitutes for the cornstarch. The overall goal of my PhD is to use this bundle of biomass and separate it into its three main components and then use the hemicelluloses to turn it into sugars and to make um, PHA out of it. This is because hemicelluloses are largely underutilized and in contrast to cellulose are a waste product. Now, why don't we use hemicellulose sugars already? The problem with hemicellulose sugars is that um, they can be up to, uh, can be a mixture of five different types of sugars, and bacteria really like the black sugar, which is the common sugar, um, standard sugar glucose, but uh, the sugars on the left have a different form, which bacteria usually don't really like. Most hemicelluloses are made of 90% of these difficult sugars, but there's one type of biomass um, that has a higher share in in, in the easy sugars, which are conifers or evergreens. It's an abundant tree in Canada, it has an existing infrastructure, and, um, and wood chips are a byproduct of this infrastructure. So back from the sugars to the bioplastic, there has been one bacterium that has been described very efficient in producing PHA from even the um, difficult sugars, but it has never been tested on, the, on two of the sugars of the conifer hemicelluloses. So the first question was, can we make PHA using these sugars? So when I feed these sugars in individually to the bacteria, they grow really nicely, and all of them produce PHA. 
one of the sugars produces it as efficiently as the standard black sugar and the other sugar a little bit less but still good enough to work with. Now what about sugar mixtures? When I feed sugar mixtures in the same ratios as, uh, as they are present in conifer hemicellulosis, then the bacteria also grow really well and produce high amounts of PHA. But, uh, and they also uh, consume all of the different types of sugars at the same time. So this gave us enough evidence that um, we can turn wood chips into a nice sugar cocktail to feed the bacterium. And to get the sugars out, uh, we uh, cooked the wood chips at 160 degrees Celsius in uh, acidic water for various reaction times starting at 15 minutes. The shortest reaction time, so only 15 minutes, already gives the highest sugar content in the cocktails. But if we, let it, if we cook it longer, then the standard black sugar actually becomes the most abundant sugar in the mixture. But since we've shown that this bacterium grows just as efficiently with that um, other sugar, then the very mild reaction conditions are good enough. The problem is that even at mild reaction conditions, the cocktail doesn't only have sugars, but it also has compounds that inhibit the bacterial growth. These compounds, they can come from the other components of the biomass, so from the lignin or from hemicellulose uh, side products or from sugar degradation. In order to see which of these compounds actually inhibits the bacterial growth, I tested each of them individually and uh, found that vanillin most reduces the, um, the bacterial growth. So instead of having a sugar cocktail, I really have more of a vanilla shake that the bacteria is not really into. Um, to turn this vanilla shake back into a sugar cocktail, the next step is to do a detoxification procedure that has been described in the literature. By applying various treatments, I hope that eventually I can remove the vanillin and make a sugar cocktail that corresponds to the taste of this bacterium. The, oh, so to come back to the overall goal, um, the International Energy Agency estimates that one ton of PHA from corn saves 2.8 ton of, uh, of CO2, and that this amount can double when we are using biomass like wood. So I hope that in future, wood um, refineries that produce PHA can contribute to using less petroleum and therefore combat climate change. Well, thank you very much to Dr. Tomlinson for his generous uh, donation that allows me to do my research. To my excellent supervisors, Marie-Josée Dumont and um, Louis Del Rio for their great support and for you, to you for listening to me. <laughs> Excellent start. And stay up here. Not off the hook yet. And I like how when someone asks you what you're doing for your PhD, you can see PHA. <laughs> Questions for Carolyn? It has, well, it, it has in side products, which are these inhibitors that I have, that I showed. Um, but it is among the treatments that is actually considered a very mild treatment. And I, I, I started with this treatment because um, it is one of the most common treatments in, in pulp mills. That, so it's something, a process that is very easy and that, uh, that is already, it has an existing infrastructure. The next step, once I prove that we can use hemicellulose hydrolysates, um, would be to, to go more into green chemistry and see if we can also use other procedures that are eventually not using sulfuric acid, but maybe organic acids or bio-based acids. Yeah, that's very interesting because um, the, these inhibitors, they can be nutrition and they can be inhibiting. So, for example, um, they can be nutrition because they are made, or these compounds that I tested, they are also carbon com compounds. So they have an energy content that some bacteria have the, the metabolism to, to convert and to grow from. But it depends on the amount that you, that you feed. Um, some of them, they, they'll never make bacteria grow, but some of them, it's just, it's just it depends on how much are, are present. Um, so you have around 30% hemicellulosis in 
in wood and from that to turn this into PHA is uh, a maximum of 20%. So you, you use, so for PHA production, it's in, in terms of material, it's not the most efficient, um, but hemicelluloses are currently burned, and uh, in, in, for, term, for PHA, really, the main benefit is that it has uh, the compostability and, um, and the non-toxicity. So uh, the, even though it reduces, it, it doesn't recover 100% of, uh, of the biomass, it has added benefits. Great. Thank you, Carol. Thank you. Excellent. Our next presenter is Aaron Liu. Aaron is a first year PhD student in Talmudson Scholar in the Department of Epidemiology, Biostatistics, and Occupational Health. She has worked as a senior analyst at Cancer Care Ontario and as a methodologist at the Ottawa Hospital Research Institute. She received her master's in epidemiology from Queens and her BSc in health sciences from the University of Ottawa. Aaron, please. How many of you have ever tried breathing through a straw? It's hard, right? Like you actually have to think more about inhaling and exhaling. What if that was the only way you could breathe? How long do you think you could last? Now imagine that straw getting smaller and smaller over time. Try breathing through that straw as you're doing your daily activities like walking up a flight of stairs. This is what people with chronic obstructive pulmonary disease experience, and it will affect them for the rest of their lives. What is COPD? This is Joe. Joe has COPD, which means his lungs are not working properly, causing him a lot of difficulty in breathing, not unlike the exertion required for you and I to breathe through that straw. In Canada, there are more than 800,000 adults with COPD. And despite this huge number of people, we know surprisingly very little about how they're managing their disease. For example, are patients seeing their doctors regularly? Are they receiving their medications on time? And are they getting access to the right resources? There's a lot we don't know. What we do know is that many patients are deteriorating quickly and being rushed to the hospital when they shouldn't be. One of the issues is that we don't really know how to best manage chronic diseases. All we have are general guidelines, a one-size-fits-all approach, when really what we need is something more customized based on the characteristics and needs of the patient. My next question for you is, how many of you have Netflix? <laughs> Isn't it cool how Netflix seems to know, thank you by the way, um, exactly which new show or movie you're going to like or get addicted to? I don't know about you, but my list of topics for Aaron is freakishly accurate. And it does this by using computer algorithms on this vast amount of customer data. By finding other Netflix users who are similar to you, it learns from their preferences to generate your personal recommendations, essentially tailoring your entertainment experience. Now, why can't we bring this technology to healthcare, right? I mean, wouldn't it be great if we can adapt those algorithms, apply them to healthcare data, and tailor the patient experience? That is what I'm going to be doing in my PhD. Over the next four years, I'll be working to develop new analytical methods by looking at the patterns of care of COPD patients. Basically, we want to know how much of a difference we can make in a patient's disease progression based on how they're managed and treated. My PhD project will be using data from health insurance claims. This is data that's already being collected for administrative purposes. 
And we currently have information on all physician visits, hospitalizations, prescriptions, and vital statistics for a cohort of 85,000 COPD patients in the province. My methods will borrow from the field of computer science to look at the nature, quantity, and timing of health services used by COPD patients to cluster them into distinct groups. And then within these groups, we can see which types of patients are on a path towards stable disease versus which ones are not. We can learn from the patients on these good paths to then tailor our interventions and policies appropriately. And the impact of this is that we can help doctors identify which types of patients may benefit from increased follow-up or which ones may struggle with managing all their medications. At the regional level, we can help public health identify areas that may need to improve screening rates or other places that may be lacking in respirologists. The goal of all of this is to use the incredible wealth of data that we have to improve the way that chronic diseases are being managed in Canada. I know that we can cure COPD. However, we can help those with disease by keeping them stable for longer. Today I talked about a lot of things. I mentioned Netflix, data, patterns of healthcare use. But if there's one takeaway I want you to have, it's that we are trying to help patients. Patients like Joe to keep their straws from shrinking. So first of all, I would like to thank Dr. Tomlinson for your incredible generosity to support me in pursuing this research. Thank you so much to my supervisors, Dr. David Buckridge and Dr. Jean Berbeau for your mentorship and guidance. Without you, none of this would be possible. I'm extremely grateful to the members of my lab and the department for all your support. And finally, I would like to thank all of you here today for listening to my presentation. Thank you. Questions for Aaron? That's a really good question. Um, so because we're using health administrative data, we'll be mostly looking at uh, variables like, like their demographics, you know, maybe where they live, and also perhaps um, there's other types of medications that they have or patients with certain types of comorbidities, they may need more complex um, care because of their characteristics. So that'd be an example of trying to um, help identify those types of patients for the doctor. Um, that's, that would be really interesting. Um, we currently don't have that type of data yet, but it's definitely a possibility to look into in the future. Uh, oh yes, the, um, the time component is really important because a lot of the current methods don't really account for the sort of um, trajectory of care over the course of the patient's journey. So that is one of the um, uh, analytical methods that we'll be um, like accounting for in our analysis is that whole like timing and the time to event like you're talking about the survival analysis. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Ryan. Our next presenter is Jennifer Heyman, a Tomlinson Scholar in Experimental Psychology. She's originally from Connecticut and received her bachelor's degree from the Pennsylvania State University. She's a first year PhD student working with Dr. Lauren Heumann. Jennifer is researching the ways in which technology impacts how people see one another. Jennifer. So, uh, thank you for the introduction. Again, I am Jennifer Heyman. I'm a first year PhD student in experimental psychology here at McGill, obviously. Um, I work with Dr. Lauren Heumann in the Social Interaction and Perception Lab. And today I'm gonna to be talking to you about online social network use and in-person social interactions, associations with the positivity and accuracy of personality impressions. So if there's one thing that defines our culture today, it's technology. 
We're in this so-called technological era where it seems like every day, every hour, every minute, we're being presented with some new form of technology. And it started with just basic typewriters and desktop computers and has since evolved into cell phones, smartphones, and even virtual reality. One piece of technology that's really taken off in recent years is social media, like Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. People are able to connect to each other almost constantly by posting on each other's walls, sharing articles, and sending pictures back and forth. And it seems like a great way for people to connect to one another and has developed a new level of friendship. And these online social networks appear to be meaningfully related to our offline experiences. One benefit is that people seem to be able to gain social capital from their online relationships. That is, the resources that one gains from their network of relationships. This could be anything from just basic information to strong emotional support. However, it may not be all positive. It has been shown that psychological well-being and social involvement can decrease within the first one to two years of being online. Also, more frequent Facebook use has been shown to be related to reduced subjective well-being. And for those of you that don't know, well-being can be defined as the state of being comfortable, happy, and healthy. So it's rare nowadays to be in a situation where you don't have some form of technology within arm's reach. It's so common to see a group of people all sitting around a table, but no one's actually talking to one another. Instead, they're all on their phones or their computers, concerned with something that is happening somewhere else, instead of focusing on the interactions that are happening right in front of them. So there seems to be this divide between our virtual online world and our actual physical world. And although we know a little bit about how this virtual world relates to our offline experiences, as I mentioned before, it has not yet been researched how this virtual world relates to our actual offline face-to-face -face interactions with other people. And that's what I hope to look at throughout the course of my PhD, starting with this study. So this study wanted to look at how online social network use relates to two aspects of first impressions normativity and accuracy, which I'll define in a moment, and both of which have been shown to be linked to positive relationship development. We chose to look at first impressions here to see how online social network use relates to how people perceive others whom they've never met before, but I'll explain later our plan to look at other types of relationships as well. So first, just a few definitions. Personality can be defined as the various characteristics that make up who you are. So for me, I see myself as being quite ambitious and thorough, but I'm not very funny. So it's how various characteristics come together to make you, you. Now, normativity, when you see this, think normal. Normativity is defined as seeing others in line with the average, normal, socially desirable personality profile. And normally, people are seen in a more positive light, so more through these rose-colored glasses. So I might see Susie as being more caring than she is self-absorbed. Accuracy can be defined as seeing someone in line with their own unique personality profile. And this is both within an individual, so I would see John as being more talkative than he is caring, but also between individuals. So I would see John as being more talkative than Mike. So how close can you get to the bullseye when you're perceiving someone else's personality? Now, for this study, to look at online social network use, we focus solely on Facebook. So we asked participants about various aspects of their Facebook use. So do you use Facebook frequently? Do you have a lot of friends on Facebook? How often do you accept friend requests that were sent to you from other people? And how often do you add friends? So send those friend requests to other people. So what we did is we had participants come into our lab and they filled out a measure assessing what they thought their own personality was like. Afterwards, they underwent a round robin paradigm where each participant interacted with every other participant for three minutes, kind of like a speed dating event. And then they would rate what they thought their partner's personality was like. And then once that was done, they filled out the Facebook measures that I mentioned before. So here's just a sample of some of our results. What we found was that having more friends on Facebook and using Facebook more frequently was related to seeing others more normatively, so more through those rose-colored glasses. However, if you had fewer friends on Facebook or used Facebook less frequently, you saw people less normatively. On the other hand, adding more friends on Facebook, so actually sending out those friend requests to other people, was related to seeing others less accurately, so less in line with how that person viewed themselves. But if you added fewer friends on Facebook, so send out less friend requests, you saw people more accurately. So you were more likely to hit that bullseye when you were judging the other person. So overall, uh, this study showed that Facebook use can relate to how we perceive other people, but it depends on how you use it. Because again, adding friends on Facebook had different results than if you simply had more friends in general or used Facebook more frequently. So it seems that some forms of Facebook use can be more beneficial than others. 
So in the future, we hope to look at more specific measures of Facebook to see if those who just passively scroll through Facebook see others differently than those who are very active on Facebook, so sh share a lot of articles or post a lot of pictures. We also want to look at other online social networking sites like Twitter and Instagram to get a more general idea of how online social networks relate to how people see others. We're going to broaden this even more by looking at other forms of technology and other types of relationships to get a more comprehensive view of how technology in general relates to how people interact with one another. Right now we're planning a study to see whether or not the presence of a cell phone relates to how people interact with one another when they're having a discussion with their romantic partner, so within a couple interaction. But this study was the first step in determining how technology in general might relate to how people interact in person, even if the people are not actually using that technology within the interaction. So I am very excited to continue with this research throughout the rest of my PhD. So finally, I would just like to thank all of you for listening today. Uh, I would like to thank Dr. Jeremy Bysands and Dr. Lauren Human for their contributions to this research, and specifically to Lauren for being a wonderful supervisor during my first year here. And of course, uh, Dr. Tomlinson for his very generous contribution and allowing me to pursue this line of research. Thank you. So as I mentioned before, maybe not so much to Facebook, but the technology in general, um, we're planning a study right now to see if that presence of a cell phone affects these interactions. So basically, we're allowing some people to have their cell phones with them while they're having a conversation with a partner. Others, we're taking their cell phones away. And we're going to see if that results in any differences. Potentially, I have not looked at that yet, but I like that idea. Um, so we, we didn't actually measure in this study, like, how do you use Facebook on your computer, on your phone? But we are doing a follow-up study right now uh, that addresses some of those questions. So how often do you use Facebook via your phone or you know, on your computer? So hopefully we'll get to that. So I didn't present it here just for simplicity's sake, but we did uh, also look at well-being. Uh, we found a few correlations. Um, remember, so using Facebook more frequently was positively correlated to relationship well-being, but not to other well-being measures that we found. We also found that having more friends on Facebook was positively correlated to self-esteem, subjective well-being, and relationship well-being. But adding friends and accepting friends on Facebook was actually negatively correlated to self-esteem and relationship well-being. Uh, I think, it, if I remember correctly, um, if you have higher well-being, you do see others more accurately, and I think more normatively as well. Um, uh, so actually, when we were running these analyses, we did control for just general number of Facebook friends during some of these correlations, and that actually strengthened some of the data that we found. So the uh, adding Facebook friends, which I didn't, well, I presented part of it here, that was marginally negatively associated with seeing others normatively. So if you added more friends, you saw people less normatively. But that effect actually became significant after controlling for the number of Facebook friends. Great. Thank you. Our next speaker is Shane Weeb. Shane was born and raised in Fort St. John, located in northern British Columbia. In 2014, he received his bachelor's in honors physiology from the University of Alberta, and then continued in physiology to complete his master's two years later. He's a Tomlinson scholar in the first year of his PhD in Dr. Sonnenberg's lab, and continues to stoke his curiosity of the biochemistry of brain function. Shane. All right, well, thank you for the uh, nice introduction. Thank you all for being here today despite the, the rainy weather. I'm much appreciated. Um, today I'd like to tell you a little bit about my thesis work, which is translational control in autism spectrum disorder. I'm delighted to give this talk in honor of Dr. Tomlinson. So just to start, I would like to talk about uh, what is autism. Is it going to transition? Oh. Uh, so what is Autism Spectrum Disorder? It's a neurodevelopmental and cognitive disability, and it's, it's characterized in three domains. So this is in repetitive or restrictive behavior, impaired social interaction, and delayed or absent uh, communication. 
Now, we've known about autism actually, uh, reports state way back. <laughs> uh, but the first, the first um, autism was coined in the early 20th century, and it was used to describe individuals who seemed withdrawn or uh, sort of isolated, self-absorbed, just generally uninterested in the typical society. Uh, by the mid 20th century, uh, Leo Kanner uh, actually uh, was the first to describe a, a patient with autism in his landmark paper. And there were sort of a couple issues that came out at the time. The first was that his diagnosis uh, only encompassed a very narrow range of patient symptoms, um, which was problematic. And the other was that he uh, suggested that autism came about due to a lack of uh, parental warmth or care or compassion towards their child. And the term refrigerator mother came about uh, to describe the etiology of the condition. And this, unfortunately, remained for uh, a number of decades. Now, in the 21st century, uh, the autism community has been pivotal in pushing this idea of neurodiversity. And this is a more holistic and encompassing view of the disorder and doesn't is not so restrictive in uh, the etiology. Uh, in 2013, finally, we uh, decided to use the term autism spectrum disorder as sort of this umbrella term to describe all the different kinds of autisms that we were observing. So as you can see here, depending on where an individual lies on the spectrum, they could experience their symptoms to a greater or lesser uh, degree. Now, in combination with this broadened diagnostic parameter and increased public awareness, we've seen a striking increase in the prevalence of autism, especially in the United States, but uh, all, all the way across the world. And this has, of course, grabbed public attention, the media attention, and, and the scientific community. So together, this sort of begs the question, what causes autism? This has been sort of a misnomer for a while. Uh, I'd like to clear the air straight away and say vaccines do not cause autism. Uh, the original publication was actually shown to be fraudulent. It was removed, and countless publications since then have uh, shown that this is not the case. Uh, however, it seems that environment plays a minor role, but by and large, uh, autism is a genetic disorder. And um, we know this from twin studies, which have shown that the heritability for autism is about 90%. Uh, so really mostly genetic. However, we don't, most of the genes involved in the disorder, we actually don't know what they are. And this is because it's complicated. There are literally hundreds of genes that have been implicated or linked to the development of autism. And furthermore, there can be multiple mutations and multiple genes that these individuals are harboring. Uh, so that complicates the story. But what I hope you can appreciate from this slide is that these mutations don't seem to be random, but rather they fit into uh, sort of groups of proteins that are involved in, in similar functions. And this gives us a good idea into what's actually happening in the brain of these individuals. So for my PhD, my focus is studying one of these clusters of proteins, and that is uh, proteins of the synapse. Now, just to give you a little orientation, the synapse is the, the, the location between ner um, brain cells uh, that allows them to communicate with one another and throughout the brain. And as you can see, uh, there's a lot of proteins in the synapse that maintain its structure and its function. Zooming in a little bit more, there's a class of proteins that are called regulators of translation. And essentially what these proteins do is they regulate the expression of all the other proteins. So you can imagine uh, if there's problems here, there's going to be problems uh, throughout the whole circuitry. So just to take a little step back into basic biology, what is translation? Uh, and this goes really back to the central dogma of biology. It's the process where novel proteins are synthesized based on the genetic code of an organism. And it's not such a linear process like this. It's highly regulated, uh, highly controlled at many levels. And from this slide, I just hope you can appreciate the amount of work that's gone into elucidating some of these mechanisms. And there's still more to be known. Uh, it's, it's very complicated. And we now have a deep uh, appreciation for how important this is in terms of health and disease. So the question is, how do we take uh, something so complicated and study it in uh, terms of the brain? So like I said, there's multiple genes that can be involved, and they can be expressed in different regions of the brain and contribute to different behaviors that we're observing. 
so this is this is sort of the challenge we're facing. And the technique or one of the tools we're using to study this is with genetic models. So in, a, in an animal model, we can uh, specifically uh, delete a gene of interest in a targeted region of the brain or population of cells and see if we can recapitulate some of the uh, behavioral abnormalities or uh, some aspect of the disease in the animal model itself. So really the goal of my PhD and my research in general is to understand autism from the biomolecular level all the way up to behavior. Right? What are these molecules doing in terms of their cellular function? How does that alter uh, brain connectivity, brain function, and ultimately the behavior of uh, the organism? It's quite a daunting task, but I feel I have a lot of support. And with that, I'd like to thank Dr. Tomlinson for his contribution and support of this research. Uh, everyone in the Sonnenberg Lab, thank you very much, uh, especially Dr. Sonnenberg for your uh, uh, mentorship and support to the various funding agencies, and thank you for your time and attention. Oh, like uh, the epigenetic factors. So, I, so epigenetics that would, that would fall more into like the, the like the the ten percent of the environmental factors. Uh, I don't know of the evidence for that at this point. That's been suggested that this this is part of it, but at this point we don't really have much of uh, like a causal relationship, right? It's, if it is something, it's been implicated or linked, but nothing we don't know yet. Yeah. Yeah, that's, the, that's a good question. Um, so we can't really like study this in patients, obviously, yeah. Uh, so in, the best we can do is see what aspects we can recapitulate in an animal model. So for example, uh, some, some patients, they may have uh, the, some of these core deficits I talked about, but they also may have like enhanced learning and memory, right? So if we're studying a protein and we see, oh, they show these autistic like phenotypes uh, or these uh, behavioral, uh, issues as well as enhanced learning memory, maybe that's or sort of on the high functioning end of the spectrum, right? So that's, um, so then in that case we would know, oh, this protein is likely contributing more towards this and less, you know, yeah. I'm working on a, a few, few projects uh, along these lines. Um, uh, I mean, the hippocampus is one very important for learning and memory, for example. But we, we look, when we characterize these models, we look at uh, these core deficits I talked about so we can test for their social behavior, see if they have abnormalities there, repetitive behavior, that sort of thing. So we sort of start with that sort of screening process and see, oh, do they have any of these phenotypes? And then dig deeper, like, okay, maybe this region of the brain uh, where we deleted this gene is, uh, if it's important for this, maybe it's also important for something else. Yeah. Yeah, so that, yeah, that's a, that's a good point. And uh, going back to the, the slide I showed about the, the different genes where they're expressed in the brain, the idea of that is really to see uh, how are, they, how are these, these proteins or these genes responsible for these behaviors, right? And, 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 that, and that's the biggest thing, because we really have no idea, right? What, what causes social behavior? You know, we, we, we can't just say the prefrontal cortex makes you, uh, you have a good sense of humor or something, right? We have no idea. It's probably multiple regions, multiple genes. So, I mean, fundamentally, yeah, we are seeking to understand that. And, I'm, and I wouldn't be opposed if I find an interesting model that, uh, you know, I'll pursue that line of inquiry as well. Great. Thank you. Sure. Thank you very much. Our next Tomlinson scholar is Emily Donaldson. Emily recently graduated from McGill with a PhD in anthropology, so I guess it's Dr. Donaldson. Her previous experience includes work as an archaeologist and a landscape historian in the United States. Since 2001, she has also worked and studied in the Marquesas Islands. She hopes to continue building her career around the intersection of people and their environments. Emily. Thanks so much. Um, 
So today, as we face climate change, ethnic, uh, widespread ethnic violence, and mass migration, we find ourselves needing to think globally. Sustainability is about planning our future based on the value of certain resources that are prioritized using judgments about what constitutes something like an endangered species or a cultural tradition. We like to believe that our answers to these questions are objective and scientific, and maybe the principles of science are objective um, and therefore universal, but our solutions to these problems are decidedly not. The sustainability goals pursued by government and uh, civil society organizations around the world are culturally biased. At worst, they risk aggravating rather than abating the global challenges we face. So I would like to invite you to come to the distant Marquesas Islands where I studied this question. Um, the title of my talk is Thinking Ahead by Looking Behind Heritage and Sustainability in the Marquesas Islands. The Marquesas are a group of six small islands in French Polynesia. They remain a colony of France. They have a population of about 10,000 people that are mainly agricultural, agricultural and they speak both French and Marquesan. And um, after centuries of Christianity and mass depopulation, uh, the Marquesas have lost a lot of their cultural knowledge, so uh, historic descriptions of cannibals have stuck with Marquesans today. And I was... Uh, after studying the Marquesas for more than a decade uh, before my doctoral research, I was still surprised to see how this past still influences Marquesans and their relationship to the land and the environment. And um, my curiosity was piqued by this. Um, the previous slide showed a historic platform that was restored and then allowed to go into decay very quickly. So it, I was very curious about why this happened. And it's timely because the Marquesas are currently being nominated to the UNESCO World Heritage List, which uses these objective characteristics like location and uh, feeling um, use materials to identify sites for their list. And the result is a, is a selection of sites prioritized upon objective properties. Um, and the goal is to recognize the Marquesas' rich legacy of endemic species and uh, vibrant cultural traditions. I spent uh, a year living with Marquesan families, visiting historic ruins and learning about their livelihoods by participating in picking fruits and chopping coconuts, that sort of thing. And what I discovered was that uh, Marquesans see this, these questions very differently. They have a very different perspective of the past and the value of resources. Um, what I discovered through these site visits and some 400 interviews um, was that the fact that this, they have this very painful past that's marked by centuries of colonialism and depopulation and cultural suppression. Um, the Marquesan past actually haunts historic places that are now being promoted as, uh, and celebrated as heritage. The great majority of Marquesans actually interpret sites based not on their physical attributes or their historic context, but on their association with spirits. So islanders feel their surroundings much more than they hear or see uh, them. Marquesans of all ages described getting goosebumps, feeling a weight on their shoulders, or hearing strange sounds when the spirits were present. And they manifest respect for the spirits in very specific ways. So a farmer here built his fire at a distance from the historic wall. Um, and if you are disrespectful, you can have bad luck, you can get really sick, um, you can even die at the hands of these angry ancestors. Um, so islanders really feel the presence of spirits through their bodies and they interact with them by speaking and behaving in specific ways, um, and which makes historic places more sites of fear often than of strength. And as a result, the frightening and traumatic past literally lives and moves in their present kind of collapsing our own um, idea of linear time. But as Catholics, Marquesans hesitate to speak about what many see as pagan spirits. Um, still, as shown here, there's a real pattern in why the re their reasons for respecting historic sites. So the risk of suffering harm is a very powerful motivator. The magnificent historic landscapes of the Marquesas can in some cases represent the kind of cultural pride that UNESCO hopes to promote. But for islanders like these women who refused to come onto the historic platform when I was visiting it, um, such sites are often places more of uncertainty and uh, discomfort. So local practices of respect for historic ruins um, can actually lead to either neglect or uh, 
to preservation based on the presence of spirits and family connections to the land. And these values clash with those of heritage advocates, which you can see in this chart is, leaving, is leading to uh, struggles over power and influence, and um, it's detrimental to the maintenance of restored sites which does not bode well for sustainable preservation of either natural or cultural resources. So despite UNESCO's honorable intentions to respect the quote unquote cultural uh, context of local heritage, their failure to recognize these crucial conflicting cultural values um, is very risky in terms of actually helping to preserve the resources. Um, it also overlooks important overlap, overlaps between ancestral respect and heritage preservation goals. So most Marquesans, as shown here, think that historic structures are in fact important, but the reasons for that should be the starting point for a more productive, more sustainable resource management strategy. Um, so to return to our point of departure, the values of people use the values people use to prioritize resources very widely and sometimes unexpectedly. My findings emphasize the need to understand local meanings first. Even as we move towards more global scale of problem solving, um, well-meaning governments and organizations need to be aware of how intimidating they are. Um, Simply acknowledging cultural context without following through endangers the very resources we are trying to preserve. An anthropolo anthropologist can help to address this issue by using their deep cultural knowledge. My hope is that this will allow us to confront our vast felt global challenges more responsibly and sustainably. Thank you so much for coming. I want to thank my supervisor, Colin Scott, uh, the Marquesan people uh, the, of the Vanier Canada, Canada Graduate Scholarship, and especially Dr. Tomlinson for this amazing opportunity to do this research. And as they say in the Marquesas, vai inui yatato. Great question, thanks. Um, my interpretation of historic sites were basically any sort of ruin left over from the ancestors that people are still working around. Those are the ones that I was looking at. There are only, um, there are two surviving forts in the Marquesas, but otherwise there's very little, and when you do an archeological dig at one of these sites, you dig up a bunch of colonial stuff. But on the surface, it's really, um, it looks more, it's like a traditional Marquesan site, so the clo that colonial aspect and the struggle that was involved is not um, very visible. Yeah. Question? Yep. It was, it was kind of tricky. I was really glad that I had previous experience there, so I, I already spoke some Marquesan, and I spoke fluent French. Um, and I knew a lot of people already, so getting into these kind of like really uncomfortable topics was easier in some ways. Um, it was, uh, people definitely like sometimes would ask me like, do you believe in them? Do you believe in the spirits? Like um, kind of trying to get an idea of what my sp spiritual background was. Um, but they also, they have, um, they have like a different category for people who aren't Marquesan. So I think that that played a role and maybe sometimes facilitated my ability to go visit places with people and stuff like that. Um, I think as an American, I had an advantage too because it's not part of the, it's, I wasn't part of the colonial institution as a French person. Um, so they were more willing to open up maybe. Um, great question though, that was definitely a factor. Excellent question. Um, I first went there as an archaeology student, as an undergraduate, and I had taken French in school and just kind of wanted to use it, um, and then just got hooked. I loved it there, and I've been going back ever since. Um, and so I talked. I talked to like a, I talked to a priest, a Marquesan priest, about how they they kind of negotiate these differences. And I think his perspective reflects the greater Marquesan perspective is that it's two parts of you that you are constantly kind of, um, they're, they're, they're equally important to you. And when you're in a forest environment, you're sensing that place in a very Marquesan way. So if you feel the spirits, it's not like, oh, wait, I'm a Catholic. I don't feel that. Um, 
I think they don't see it as like, I, th I think their form of Catholicism is also more flexible, like premarital relations are very accepted there and that sort of thing. So I think that helps in some respects, but it's definitely a blend for pretty much all Marquesans. Yeah. Still quite, quite nope? Okay. Great. Thanks. Thank you. Okay, our final presenter is Suzanne Vandervelt, who is a Tomlinson Scholar in the Integrated Program in Neuroscience. Suzanne received her undergraduate degree in Cognitive Science at Utrecht uh, in the Netherlands. She was then selected for a prestigious Nerasmus European two-year master's program in neuroscience, where she studied at the VU University Amsterdam in the Netherlands, the University of Bordeaux, and the Medical University Charité in Berlin, and maybe she can tell you how she managed to do that all in two years. In January 2016, she started her PhD studies under the co-supervision of Dr. Trefiliev at the University of Bordeaux and Dr. Leheshi at the Neuroinflammation Lab of the Douglas Institute here at McGill. That's a mouthful. Suzanne, please. Thank you very much. Good afternoon. I'm very honored to be here today. And I'm very happy, actually, to tell you a little bit about my thesis research, the research on the brain reward system, or the science of motivation, as I like to call it. So last weekend, and maybe this is familiar to some of you, but last weekend I spent about four hours on what was supposed to be a 30-minute workout. Uh, unfortunately, three and a half of these hours were spent on the couch, checking Facebook, Instagram, uh, and then like a large number of cat videos that I would be ashamed of. And somehow I could not motivate myself to get off that couch and do this workout while I knew that in the long term it would give me much more satisfaction than this immediate fun of watching the cat videos. And this really is motivation, the, the willingness to work for a preferred reward over something that's more easily obtainable. So the science of motivation, the neuroscience of motivation, has been quite difficult to disentangle. So we know that in the brain there are a number of neurotransmitters uh, that allow uh, for the communication between the 86 billion neurons of the brain. We know that one of these neurotransmitters is dopamine. So dopamine seems to be involved in a, in a wide range of behavioral processes, and maybe you have already heard of it. Uh, it seems to be involved not only in reward and motivation, but also in attention, in memory, in movement, all of these different, different things. So I look at dopamine, and it seems that for reward and motivation, it seems to kind of matter which pathway dopamine takes, which dopamine highway, so to say. What we think for reward processing in your brain is, the, is this neuronal projection called the mesolimbic pathway. This pathway originates in the deeper parts of the brain in a structure called the ventral tegmental area and then projects onwards uh, to the rest of the brain. So one of the stops of this mesolimbic pathway is a structure called the nucleus accumbens. So it seems that a sudden increase in dopamine levels in this nucleus, nucleus accumbens signals to your brain that something really important is going on and you need to pay attention. Basically, it does not only help you to focus your attention on it, but also to move towards it. So, but imagine what happens if your dopamine does not end up in your nucleus accumbens, because for some reason your dopamine highway is kind of off. Like for me, I think of this as, you know, my, my four hour workouts, but imagine that this is a daily struggle. And this is actually the case in a, in a range of psychopathologies, uh, including, for example, schizophrenia. So often what we think of when thinking of schizophrenia are these well-known characteristics like uh, delusions and hallucinations, but what seems to be the most debilitating and the, the most difficult to treat in schizophrenia is really this debilitating deficit in motivational processing, the, the ability to get yourself off the couch and do something. So uh, a large number of studies actually have investigated the, the causes of schizophrenia, looking at genetic factors, environmental factors, and a very important clue comes from epidemiological studies showing the strong correlation between uh, maternal immune activation and the chances of the offspring later in life developing schizophrenia. So, however, um, the mechanism behind this, maternal, behind this maternal inflammatory activity and the changes in the brain development are unknown. So that's what I'm looking at for my PhD thesis, and I decided to look at that in the mouse. So that might look strange to you, but actually when you look at the mesolimbic pathway, the mouse and the human is not that diff different in the end. So the mouse has the same mesolimbic projection that originates in the ventral tegmental area. Here you see the mouse brain, and then projects onwards to the nucleus accumbens, providing dopamine. 
So what we think is going on in these reward deficit um, uh, pathologies is that for some reason this pathway is not well constructed. It's a little bit off. Um, however, how, this is not entirely sure. Our main subject for sabotage are the microglia. So microglia are the immune cells of the brain that are normally involved in uh, fighting off bacteria and viruses that are infecting the brain. It does some housekeeping tasks. Like generally, it does everything to keep the neurons in the brain healthy and happy. So actually quite recently, it has been discovered that there's a very exciting second task for these microglia and that they're actually involved in brain development. It seems that they function as some sort of guidepost cells, telling the growing neurons where they should project to and what other neurons they should connect to. So this seems to be particularly the cause for this mesolimbic projection in your brain. So these two functions of the microglia made us hypothesize that maybe during maternal immune activation, these microglia are so busy uh, fighting off this infection that they cannot do their normal regular task in brain development, hence causing this mesolimbic reward pathway to be a little bit off in the adults. When then, in the adults, your dopamine cannot reach your nucleus accumbens or um, it reaches us in different amounts, we see this behaviorally as this reported lack of motivation or this lack of drive. So how I decided to study this in my mouse model was um, by taking uh, pregnant uh, female mice and then I inject a bacterial extract at a certain window in the pregnancy. So this extract is called lipopolysaccharide. And I inject this at the uh, 13th day of the pregnancy. I then take the offspring and I wait till they reach adulthood. And then in that adult mouse, I can do a range of tests to test for the proficiency uh, or, for the behavior, or for the dopaminergic signaling. So one of these tasks is operant conditioning. So basically what I do here, I take the adult mouse and I put it in a box. And I teach it that it can press a lever to obtain a food reward. So the mouse soon learns this, and what I can then do is I can play around with how difficult I make it for the mouse to obtain this reward, seeing the willingness to work of this mouse to obtain the preferred reward over going for the easy way out. By doing this, I hope to unravel the mechanism behind the maternal immune uh, infection and the chances of later in life developing schizophrenia. I want to figure out better how these microglia, microglia cells affect brain development. By doing so, I hope to unravel uh, a little bit more about uh, the underlying physiology of these reward, uh, reward deficits and add some missing pieces of the puzzle to, to, um, to the, the development of schizophrenia. So I want to express my sincere gratefulness to Dr. Tomlinson for allowing me the chance to be part of such exciting research. I also want to, chance, uh, want to thank my lab at the Douglas Mental Health University Institute. I want to thank both my supervisors who are here, Jamal Loheji and Pierre Tuvaliev. And I want to thank you all very much for your attention. Questions for Suzanne? Yes, that's a very good, very good question. Um, so the problem here is, of course, that the model is very simplistic. We're only looking here at this environmental factor of um, matern or maternal immune activation. Um, we don't really look at the genetic factors. Well, there's a lot of research actually showing that it might be, you know, it's genetically you're more vulnerable, and then it's the second hit of this maternal immune activation or whatever environmental factor that then actually causes you to have this altered development of the mesolimbic factor. So we know it's an interplay, but unfortunately, this model is, is, is limited, of course. Um, so basically, there are kind of two ways that people go. Uh, either you go for viral infections or bacterial infections. So, and then for the bacterial, the LPS that we use, the lipopolysaccharide, is generally what most people in the field use. So the reason to pick that, just to make it more comparable to what other people are doing in the field. Yeah. Any other questions for Susan? Okay. Thank All right. you very much. Thank you very much. I'd like to turn things back over to Dean Novantaglut for some closing remarks. Joe. I think you were all, I hope you were all as impressed as I was at uh, the diversity uh, of the presentations, uh, at uh, uh, 
the excitement. Uh, I mean, I think we all felt the excitement of the work you were doing, which is terrific. Thank you very much. Um, so I'd like to thank the scholars again. One last applause. I think we have some gifts for people. <laughs> At least that's what it says on my list of things to do. And we also have a celebration uh, outside, uh, again in honor of Dr. Tomlinson and to celebrate the work that everyone's doing. So we're, you're all invited to the cocktail reception uh, after we give the gifts to all the scholars and to Ian for being a wonderful MC. My name is Amanda Jarrell and I'm a PhD student in the Department of Educational and Counseling Psychology and I'm also a Tomlinson Scholar. And I just wanted to really quickly say thank you so much. I'm so appreciative of this opportunity and to be able to pursue my research. Thank you so much. Hello Dr. Tomlinson. My name is Peter Bullerwell. I'm a Tomlinson Fellow in Religious Studies. I wasn't able to attend the Tomlinson Talks this year as I'm out of town. So please excuse the bad uh, iPhone video photography. Um, my research is on the influence of late antique Neoplatonic philosophers on the Anglican theologian of the 16th century, Richard Hooker. Uh, my supervisor, Torrance Kirby, is one of the very few people in the world that I know of uh, with whom I could do this kind of research. So it was very important for me to be able to come to McGill. Uh, when I applied to McGill, I had also applied for a Canada government grant, which I didn't receive. So the, receiving the Tomlinson Fellowship from McGill was really uh, instrumental in my being able to come and to be able to work with Professor Kirby and to be able to do the research that I'm doing now. So thank you very, very much for your contribution to my research. Uh, good evening, uh, Dr. Tomlinson. I just want to send my uh, sincere uh, thanks and express my gratitude for really the privilege of being here uh, in the company of uh, uh, these wonderful uh, scholars and uh, it's been an honor uh, listening to them and being grouped up among them. My name is uh, Omar Qaqish and I'm a graduate student and a Tomlinson Fellow in the uh, English PhD program. Um, so thank you very much for the opportunity and the support to conduct my research. <laughs>